setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. We've had some challenges, Taya. Look, if I'm here, you'll have more challenges with technology. I'm <laughs> We're, okay, so the red button live is up. Yep, we are live. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. There we go. Chief. Are we live? We're live, Chief. For sure? All right. I'm, For sure, I'm, 100%. Look, here you go. I got to share this real quick before we get going, right? This is, this is something I got to share. This is big. We got a special guest. I'm so excited to, to, to have her, but, but hold up. Let me get going here. Here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone out there in Facebook land. Um, we greatly appreciate, we greatly appreciate everything you're doing. Um, we really appreciate, sorry, I got, I got the, I got everything confused here because it turned live on my feed, but <laughs> hey, we messed up, right? Everyone's not perfect and it's a part of life. But first off, thanks to everyone tuning in, uh, all the airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coasties out there in Facebook land and their family members, thank you so much. Before we get to our guests, let me introduce Julie Mitchell and Leah Matthews, my co-host. Ladies, how are you doing today? Hey, Chief. Hey, Chief. How's it going? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Hey, Julie, please, hey. <laughs> please let us know who is our special guest today. I am so excited to have her here today. I can't wait to get this going. Do you mind introducing our special guest? I absolutely, it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest today. As Chief said, we are super, super honored to have her with us. She is our first military spouse to join us and she is a light of hope, especially for women. She's an activist for military families and she works to build on the legacy of her husband, Navy SEAL, Chris Kyle. She focuses on God, country and family and she told her story through her bestseller, American Wife. Please help us welcome Taya Kyle. Woo! I need to be clapping for y'all. You're doing the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, uh, tell you, it truly is a privilege to talk with, uh, with you today. Know that it means a lot to the service members and their fam military families and veterans to have you here with us to boost morale. So thank you for taking some time uh, today to spend with us. Thank you. And for everybody watching, uh, drop a note in the comments, leave some love for Taya. And if you guys want to ask her any questions, we'll be coming, we'll be calling those out throughout the interview. Also, now will be a good time to go ahead and start a watch party. I just started mine, so. Good, right. yay. <laughs> I started mine, so we're, we're ready to rock. So tell you, let, let, let's get started, right? First, we, we've been chatting through email for the past couple of weeks, so it's great to finally virtually meet you. Nice um, to meet you too. So, so let's start off. How have you been holding up during the COVID-19 pandemic? How, how's Taya been doing and the fan? You know, I almost feel bad saying this because I have a lot of compassion for people who are hurting and I have friends who are small business owners and I've been doing my best to support them. I know that it, it's hard for a lot of people. I've really really enjoyed it. Um, I hate to say it, you know, but I, the, the slowdown for me has been extraordinary. I love spending time with my kids and I spend hours every day driving them to everything they need to be at. And there seems like there's never a stop to that. So having that stop, I still get the time with them. They're getting to do things like cook dinners and um, do different chores around the house and, and yard that they've not done before, because truly I think we push our kids so hard these days and they want to be involved in so many activities that there's just no time. Right. And so I think that, um, that part has been nice. And then I've wanted to have a, a really nice yard for a really long time, but I'm too cheap or too frugal to pay the extraordinary cost people want to charge for that stuff. So this is the first time in my adult life where I've actually been able to order stuff and, you know, have things delivered. And I get out there and I dig, and I dig and I dig. It's like therapy, dirt therapy, I call it. And I get a workout, which I've been missing. Uh, I'm getting a yard put together. And then I have time to do like all these other projects that have been building up. So having said that, it's kind of my best life right now. I feel bad saying that because I don't want people to be hurting. You know, I wish we could have it both ways, but I, I'm, a, I'm a silver lining kind of girl. And so this slowdown, I think, has the potential to give a lot of people a reset. Even if it's through pain, I've lived through a ton of pain and I didn't enjoy the time in the pain, but I still did come out stronger. And I know it's not that simple when you're in it, but, 
but I see the future of that possibility for people. So before before we keep going, uh, before we keep going, who who who's that on your lap? Oh, would you be talking about nuggets? <laughs> oh, look at nugget. Yeah. I mean, nugget. Uh -oh. he's, yeah, he's like the bomb. I it's hilarious because I never thought I'd be a small dog person. And long story short, you know, here I am, this girl that's always, always, always had a big dog, never really saw the point of having a small dog, which I know we have a wiener dog owner <laughs> on the line here. And I just didn't get it, right? So I prayed about it one day. I was like, God, oh, where's the perfect dog? You know, and uh, and then I have a German Shepherd who's badass. I mean, she's my assassin. Um, she's she's so gangster that I've been in the barn before and there's been a rat, you know, freaks me out. She grabs it. And I'm like, oh, no, you know, it's going to be like a dead body in the car and the blood and all this stuff. And that girl just, she killed it, looked at me. I got this. Hid the body. I'm like, you know what? She's straight mafia. I love her. But she's not the one that's like going to be by my side all the time because she's got stuff to do. So um, Nugget is the one who, he'll do anything, man. If I want to chill, he's chilling. If I want to go run, he's running. So he's special. So you, so you, you would say you became a lap dog person? I mean, yeah, I will say this though. The other, my, my assassin is not super fond of a thunderstorm. That's the only thing I've ever seen her not. And she was in the bed with me the other night. I like, on, you know, my outdoor dog in the thunderstorm was on my white comforter and you know, whatever. So, so I, I'm good with a lap dog, but, um, but this one, he just, I don't know. He makes me laugh all the time. He's funny. He lays on my desk like a cat. I mean, I don't know. He's just, he's great. You That's get a awesome. small person, right? Dogs are great companions. Yeah, and Chief, even though you think you'd never want one, I have a feeling if you met Nuggets, you would begrudgingly be that guy with the adorable little dog in his lap, and you can't help it. I'm a big dog person. I don't know. I think I'm, I'm like I think I'm like you were before you got Nugget, right? Exactly. Like, totally. <laughs> but I will say this. Okay, here's the key to a small dog. If I, I for me, they can't be a yapper. And that's oh. the beauty of Nugget. He doesn't yap ever. Like he's he's he does not do that. So that's for me. That's mm -hmm. that's much. I, I I agree. It would drive me crazy. Rur, 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 rur. Yeah, I no, no ma'am. Nope, can't do it. <laughs> nice imitation there, Chief. Perfect <laughs> <laughs> dog. Well done. <laughs> Well, I do love my little dachshund. I have not always been that much of a dog person. I, I kind of used to say I take care of the humans. So other people need to take care of animals. Um, and, <laughs> and then a uh, couple years ago, I decided I want a dog. So she does. Yep. Uh, when people come strangers, she doesn't like strangers. Uh, but she is very much a lap dog, and until until we go live, she's in my lap all day long, and and then I have to put her outside so she doesn't yap on the live. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> and like Nugget, who is quiet on the live. Yes, Nugget's cute. Sweet. <laughs> Trying to, they're you know groomers aren't um, you know doing their thing right now either, which I totally understand. Never with my big dogs. I mean, Chief, you know, like you don't take him. I mean, I never did take him to a groomer, right? No big deal. I swore I wasn't going to take Nugget, but then one of those days I'm like, mm, I don't know how good of a, okay, let's try it. And he looked adorable. But um, yesterday I, I spent some time chopping this guy and uh, I, it's not my strength. Let's just say that, but he's <laughs> good. That's a quarantine cut. It's a, <laughs> yeah. It's a quarantine cut. Yeah. Yep. So Taya, it sounds like a lot has changed for you during the pandemic. Um, some slowdowns, which uh, seems like you're you're really enjoying that part. Um, do you you kind of mentioned new stuff that you're working on? Do you have any projects that you want to mention? Anything you want to share about what's um, what you're working on now? Yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, I was literally on the tractor the other day and thanking God that I have a life where I've suffered for sure at this. Point when a lot of people are suffering, I'm in a, a really good position and I don't ever want to overlook the gratitude that I need to have for the ability to work from home. And so I, you know, I'm a writer, so I'm working on a new book for service couples. Uh, it's about relentless love in a service marriage. It's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to be married in a service life. It's just different and it's not the same as civilian marriage and there is less help available. So we have 
our Chris Kyle Frog Foundation, where we work with service couples. And it just, it, it sort of morphed into this thing where I was able to start this, this journey of writing a book. So I'm excited to launch that. I've been working on that. And then I have a Warriors collection that I'm so excited about. And y'all have been super kind to me. And um, I appreciate that hookup with talking to the buyers for the exchange and the NX. I really hope to get this um, into the hands of as many warriors as possible. And that's the traditional warrior, like our military, their spouses who are also warriors, their kids who are warriors. And then there are just the life warriors out there who, who I think want to represent their beliefs with a signature piece. And so we're doing a limited collection on Memorial Day. People can, you know, find that on our social media or whatever. But I, I'm so excited about this because it's, it's a different kind of thing. And our logo is, is a symbolic of, of being a life warrior. And it's not as obvious a symbol as other things. And we're starting with the dog tag. So, I mean, I, you can't beat it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm excited about that. We've been working with Montana Silversmith made in the USA, which everybody says is not possible because it's too expensive. It's possible and we're dedicated to it. So I'm stoked about that. And I, um, I've got a children's book series called Prayers for Bears. And it's based on, you know, my kids and I, finding our strength and faith through hard times. So I'm excited about that one. I don't know the release date of both of those is probably next year. Um, yeah, television project for American Wife that's with TV you'd never know. And I, I you know, but we're, we're working on it with MGM and we've got some producers behind it. So it seems pretty cool for a, a limited edition TV thing. And um, I think that one's less about me and more about military folks and and other people who are are married and need to know that they're not alone in their hardships so everything i'm doing i hope is an act of service i hope that people get a lot out of it and with everything we do we give a portion of proceeds to the foundation so we can serve so anyway the point is like i have all these opportunities that i can do from home and so i'm still engaged i'm still mentally stimulated with work that i love and i i think that's a large part of the human condition we need a purpose we need some reason to get up and something to fight for and um a drive so yeah i guess i'm blessed in that way too and everybody knows my life hasn't been super blessed in a lot of ways but it's also been ridiculously blessed in others so i, I just kind of keep my focus on the blessings how about y'all are you doing okay yes ma'am we're hanging in um like you said blessed to continue to be able to work um and you know, be healthy. I think my colleagues are the same, right, Chief and Leah? Yep, absolutely. I'm hanging out with all of you, and today I'm hanging out with <laughs> Kyle. You can't beat that. Life <laughs> is good. <laughs> and it looks like you have a heart on your board behind you, Chief. What's what's that? It says uh, Mother's Day, 10 May 20. So. Oh, so you don't forget. So you don't <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You smart. Yeah, and big, big, big heart, so I don't forget that. That's so good. You probably just did a lot of people watching a favor. There's a bunch yeah. of people right now like, Ooh, thank you. Yeah. What, what is that? <laughs> yeah don't forget online shopping, man. That's the that's key too. I mean, how great is that if you think about that also, that we have the opportunity to do some online shopping. I know it's not as fast. Who cares, right? Like at least the fact that we even I'm so grateful for all of these things that I see. It's just I find, you know, there's actually science to back it up that when you focus on your, what you're grateful for, it rewires your brain and helps you avoid depression. And there's always something to be grateful for. Always. I mean, if it's the roof over your head, there are people that don't have that. You know, if it's water coming out of your tap, there are people in other countries who are walking five hours a day just to get water for their family. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we're still a really blessed nation. For sure. Great. And I'm grateful to all the people watching too who are fighting for that because I mean, I know that life is not always an easy life and sometimes it's thankless, but it's so important. We have a lot of people watching right now. Um, Mike Neiman says, it takes a special strong kind of woman to be married to a service member or a veteran. Thank God for this veteran's wife. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And all the spouses out there rocking it. We have a lot of army watching. Um, Dale Lab says US Army HUA. <laughs> yeah. um fort jillian at fort drum says good afternoon she's watching as well um okay. so we have someone saying thanks for going live one team that's robin 
So we have a lot, a lot of people watching today. They're eager to hear from you. Um, oh, thank you. And it's she... an honor to be with all of you too. Because it's um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, just connected this way is cool. Thank you, Chief. I want to point out that Dale Killip says buy online, pick up curbside for your Mother's Day stuff. Good point. Good point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for that reminder, Dale. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm wait. I think I'm wait to Memorial Day. So pick up a warrior collection piece. Yes, yes. Uh, but you know, I would. I mean, I might still have a little something on the day. You know what I mean? So it doesn't look like you forgot. You obviously didn't forget. Yeah. But you know, really, like this is a time to be super uh, creative. I mean, there's you could go out and pick some wildflowers, right? And and it's cool. Marcus as well does it for his wife. You know what I mean? It's badass to be. Be able to be both that and you could take branches from a tree and spray paint them like gold or silver you know strip the leaves off and just put a little bouquet together and throw it in there write something even if you're not a good writer i feel like if you take a minute and write something um to your wife who's the mother of your kids to your mom i just i feel like this is an opportunity to show it's not about the amount of money that you spend on a present i mean it's cool and there are love languages obviously we all have a love language and some people's is gifts but I don't know that it has to be a great monetary value. I think we have an opportunity right now to do things more simply and to make things for our family members, which we've gotten away from. And I think it's really gratifying. I just, I don't know, I, maybe I'm a Pollyanna right now, but I just feel like there's so much, I've missed a lot of the simple, smaller things. I have struggled with the pace of, and I'm a fast mover, right? But the fact that I don't have the freedom to, I feel like I don't have the freedom to slow life down because something will suffer. Like the coaches expect players to be there six days a week, right? Um, if you want to specialize or if you want to participate in anything, they want it to be full time, not just when I grew up three days, right? So my point is, I just think there's so many things that we can embrace about this time. So you had mentioned writing. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about American Sniper and your book, American Wife, and what was it like having Chris's story told and your story told? Yeah, it's interesting because when Chris started writing American Sniper, he, he did not want to write a book. I mean, people told him his whole life outside of the military too. There was so much with cowboy and rodeo and he just had an interesting life. He packed a lot in and he was adamant he was not going to do it. And there came a time where people were writing books about him, his reputation, they gotten out there, the legend, this guy who was you know, great on the battlefield, humble, funny, all the, he's just an interesting person. And so when other people started writing a book about him, they were making him out to be this hero, bigger than life. And it was starting to bother him because he said, you know, I'm just as flawed as the next guy and the guys I served with deserve the attention too. So he decided to do it and it was his goal to give away all the money so nobody could come back and say he did it for selfish reasons. He was such a, a humble guy. And so he sat down and I remember right away in the beginning, we were sitting with Jim DeFelice who wrote it and you know, with us, but put the pen to paper. Mm -hmm. And he started talking about flaws and imperfections and things about our marriage. And I was like, whoa, okay, we're going there. Like we are not, we're leaving it all on the table. And, and there was such power in that because we learned after a while that people needed to know they aren't alone. Right. And it feels like you might be the only one struggling sometimes or the only one struggling in this way. So it became another act of service, which I think is beautiful. We had the, the, t the things that you don't expect. I mean, Chris never really thought it would be a book in the end. So he kind of signed off to a guy that was not, he didn't have a license to practice as an agent. I mean, he just, he gave away 30% of all the profits to that guy. Jim DeFelice got uh, he probably should have gotten a lot more, but he definitely had a percentage of the publisher. And it, it was just, we learned a lot with that too, about um, that other guy that's on the book too, in particular, in my opinion, is as rotten as they come. But, you know, we gave him our word and he was included in it. So there are those parts of things. I think people ask too, is it cathartic to write? And when we went on the book tour, oh my gosh, you're so lucky. Are you they didn't realize it was a slog too, right? It was different. It was uncomfortable. We weren't used to being in the public like that. Chris wanted to give back to people. He gave them his full attention. He didn't, you know, people would say, you need to sit down. You've got a long line. And he's like, if they're going to stand for me, I'm going to stand for them. And 
he, you know, he just, he gave a lot back with everything he had. And, and we were talking about hard times and traumatic times. And so, and people would come to us at those book signings and say their hard times and share their pain. And it just, it was a different kind of experience. You know, it wasn't like two people who always wanted to be an author and had this great story. And finally, it, you know, it was just different. It was sort of, um, it was definitely an experience that was different and, and I think misunderstood in some ways. Uh, but we learned a lot from it and I wouldn't, I don't regret it at all. I think it was one of the best gifts he could have given to the country and to those who serve. And, um, you know, it really opened my eyes that people wanted to know more about the wife. They wanted to know more about the family life. And I, I guess I didn't realize that it really wasn't talked about, you know, there weren't really those movies or those stories. And it's such a huge part of a warrior's life. Their family is their other purpose and they are equal. It doesn't feel like it when the military can call you away at any moment. It doesn't feel like it when you're volunteering to die for your country. How could your family be just as important? But, but it is, right? And so what does that dynamic look like? So we, the rough draft for American Sniper movie was turned in the day before Chris was murdered. And so we really jumped into the deep end of that and the importance of getting every detail right grew. It had to be something that people would genuinely remember him with, not just if they got it wrong, he would be there and they would get to know him differently, right? So that changed the dynamic. And I noticed that everybody involved from the people who did the props, director, actors, they were so generous with their effort and their time to do it right. It was, it was pretty extraordinary. and. I'm so grateful because I know other people who have their life story on the screen and it's not their life. It's mm -hmm. frustrating, right? And I mean, for us, it, those parts of our life, sometimes they're condensed and sometimes they're not, it didn't make sense in the movie to make them um, in a different chronological order, but it is the essence of our life. And we laughed a lot more. I mean, Chris was constantly pranking and laughing and all of that, but that's not the part that would have helped people. So we focused on the parts that really, I think people needed to, to resonate with. So I guess that's a long uh, winded answer, but American Wife, I wasn't ready to write. I mean, I, I remember sobbing to editor and Jim DeFelice saying, I can't do this right now. I'm so sorry to let you guys down, but I can't, there's no way. I mean, ugh, the lawsuits and the attacks and the lies and the betrayal and finishing his other projects and grieving and my kids and I mean, it was so upside down and, and Jim just said to me, Taya, you talk and I'll write. And because I knew him, because we had worked with him, because he was a friend, I did, you know? But it was, that was a brutal, brutal book to write. I mean, I just sobbed and like emotionally vomited on him for a long time, but, but I'm glad we did it. Wow. So Taya, we have a few questions that, that I'll ask as it kind of ties into what you're, you're you're talking about. So, so I think you kind of answered it, but just to make sure Rhonda asked, how did, how did you feel about American Cypher? Was it fairly accurate? Yes, it was accurate. And I think, like I said, some of the timeline, you know, it, it might be a little bit out of order, but the essence of it is accurate. And I think, you know, there are small things like, you know, I didn't sell Chris out in a doctor's office, but, but you couldn't tell the story that evolved over months and how we came to that and the the discussions and the divine interventions and all of that that got us to that place so it, the essence of it, uh, using that as an example is it is it you know but that situation it didn't exactly happen but i would say that you couldn't have a movie more accurate than what this one was um like i said even from the stuff he wore to the I mean, they just went above and beyond to make it amazing. And as much as they could is exact, you know, the scene in the, the tire shop where the guy comes up to him and thanks him for his service and Chris being uncomfortable. I mean, all of those things are, they are true. Hmm. Wow. April, April says, you are amazing and I admire your strength, Taya. Much love and appreciation from this military spouse and mom. Well, April, thank you for what you do because you know, we're in it together and you're still doing the heavy lifting and I thank God for people like you who are willing to do it. Here's another question from Ryan Smith. He asked, 
did Bradley Cooper capture the life of Kyle? Yeah. You know, he went above and beyond too. And that's the other thing I'm so grateful for is I know there are actors who they don't have, they feel like they don't have to, to absorb themselves so fully in a role and maybe they don't. Right. But Bradley trained with live fire weapons, which I don't know a lot of actors who do that. He really wanted to get in that headspace, and he did the lifting. Like when he's lifting that massive uh, weight in the movie overseas, that's him actually lifting those weights, not props, not plastic, you know, and it's sort of insane to ask an actor to do an accent and he did. Right. And, and I thought, cause I thought, how could you do, how could you be Chris without an accent? That was just so much a part of him and his, his charm. And, you know, I'd seen other movies where they didn't do that. And it just, if I knew the person in real life, it didn't click for me. So I felt like in those ways, he just went above and beyond with the depth of emotion that Chris had. And, you know, like the first night where he's holding Sienna's hair back, you know, uh, that happened. That's legit, you know. <laughs> And there's a tenderness, like even when he holds her hair back, he's like puts his hand on her head, you know, and it just and it and he captured all of that essence. I think it was it was awesome too because he was willing to open his spirit to feeling whatever he could get from the other side. And I think just being open to that is a beautiful thing. And there are things he said that he he just sort of ad libbed. And I noticed um even even just these nuances that Chris had, and I'm like, dude did you notice this and that? And he said, man, that wasn't even the script. I just threw that. I just felt it and I did it. And I, to me, that's so special. And I feel like he and Chris would have had such a good time. I mean, it's one of those things where, yeah, I just, you know, for as much as Chris might've thought Hollywood this, Hollywood that, you know, Bradley's not Hollywood and neither is Clint, right? I mean, they are in that world, but they are not that. And so, they're not just that is maybe a better way to say that, right? They have depth and character and fun and, oh man, they would have had so much fun. <laughs> so, so say, we know you love to help people and a lot of people are suffering during, you know, this challenging time. What words of hope can you offer? You know, it's so, I appreciate you asking that because I think going back to the part where I say, I'm, I'm grateful for all of these things and I recognize the gifts through pain Part of it is that in a military life, we have to adapt, right? You all have to adapt to change. You have to learn how to live with the unknown. And so in some ways, I think military and first responders are already more trained than the general public in this life of a pandemic where you don't know what's next. Having said that, I know there are also my friends in the military who their PCS is delayed and all of a sudden things are upside down. and there are these different dynamics that are even more challenging that they didn't have. So I think a few things. One is, I Jim DeFelice, who did American Wife with me, described my life as a journey of turning fear into faith. And I think that's so brilliant because it truly is where I've been. When we're scared, that's not God. He tells us not to be afraid. And the reason he tells us not to be afraid is he's already got it covered. And if we can just stay happy in the moment, it gives us an opportunity to see the miraculous ways that he works. And if we're trying too hard, we miss the miracles of everything he's doing on our behalf. I remember one time in the last few months, I was having trouble sleeping and I was just having awful dreams where I could tell I was processing things that were on my mind, out of my control. And I was getting into bed that night and I thought, I'm gonna pray that I have better dreams. And as I did that, I realized God's on the clock. I can sleep, right? I don't, I don't have to do these things in my sleep. He's doing it already. And it, I sure enough, I had great dreams, right? And, and so I think when people are in this situation where life is uncertain, it's helpful to acknowledge life is always uncertain. Even if you thought you knew what was happening tomorrow, you didn't and you're okay, right? And you will continue to be okay. And if bad things do happen, God has already prepared you. That's what a loving parent does. If they know their kid's going to go through something hard, they give them little bits of digestible information where maybe they don't even know that they're being prepared for the next thing. So if people can turn their fear into faith, I feel like they won't just survive it. They'll have joy in seeing how God already had provisions. 
but we have to accept that it wasn't the way we wanted. It wasn't the way we envisioned it. And the more I've done that, the more free I feel, the more free I feel, the more joy I feel. And um, yeah, I think that's where I get to the point where I'm just grateful because I'm, I'm trying a lot more to live in the present. That's awesome. Taya, you're certainly known um, for your unbreakably strong faith. Um, and you've kind of shared, you know, why this is important. And um, are, is there anything else that you want to share about that uh, for the people watching? Yeah, I think that there's a, you know, it's, it's interesting because I grew up in a house. I mean, we weren't, we went to church, we were Episcopal, you know, I said to our father and I don't think I understood having a relationship with God and any more than just feeling him. I felt like I could feel God, but I've grown in my faith through every hardship in a way that I, I, um, I find astonishing, really. It blows my mind that God is in the details of all of our lives to the extent that he is. And the more I experience of him, the more I go, holy cow, like he truly wants our joy and happiness. And I used to think maybe he orchestrated some of the bad so that he could show us the good. I totally 100% do not believe that anymore. I don't. I think there's free will and I think there's evil at work, right? I don't think there was a, a you know, a bath that randomly got a, you know, virus. I think it was orchestrated, right? And I think that that's free will of man. But I think God says, with free will of man, I can still do good with every single thing if you'll just give me the chance, right? He'll do the good things anyway, but you'll see them if you give him the chance to reveal it. And so with that, I think these conversations with God, I think the more informal, the more conversational they are, right? God, I'm hurt, I'm mad, and I'm scared. Can you take this fear from me? I mean, the most powerful experiences I had were in, in the beginning, especially where it was almost like I was testing God going, I mean, the, one, one example in particular, there's this thing of forgiveness that I needed to, to do. I wanted to let go of something. I read the books on how to do it. I went to counselors to know how to do it. I did everything I knew to do, right? And out of desperation one day, I was like, God, can you seriously just take this from me? Like, I, I'm, I've done everything I know to do. What else can I do? Can you just take it? And it washed over me and left. I mean, I was driving my car down the freeway. I'll never forget it. It washed over me and left. And this thing that I had been struggling with for years, thinking I was doing everything I could, like a good, you know, soldier would. And all of a sudden I was like, dude, seriously? I mean, I was in awe. I'm like, oh my God, that just left. That just left. Oh my gosh, he does that, you know? And so the more I've, I've given God the chance to take those things. I mean, when Chris was deployed and I was terrified that something would happen to him, I remember just laying in bed and I mean, I would sleep with the lights on sometimes just because I knew it would be tangible to, to make me feel like it would be okay, even though I knew logically it was ridiculous. And so there would be times where I would ask God, can you just take the fear from me? Please just take the fear from me so I can fall asleep. And it would work. And, you know, if I didn't fall asleep quickly, look, my mind can get right back to that fear if I want it to, you know? But, um, but I was asking for a window, just a window to fall asleep. And so I just encourage people to do that more and more and experience the miracle of it. Hey, Taya, so, so we're going to follow up on faith real quick. I'm going to read a quote. And I... I I think you know where it's from. I think you're very familiar with it. And I want you to tell me the significance and what this quote means to you. And when you hear it, you're probably going to be like, okay. Um, he has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Yeah, that's my, that is my life verse, man. I love that. I, you know what? Here's, here's also how I think we can rely on God. To, to present us with what needs to be done, right? I had been collecting Bible verses for a while. I do not know the Bible as well as I would like to. I don't know it anywhere near what most of my friends know it. I don't know it even close to what Chris did, right? I just, I experienced God and I want to know the Bible better. So as I would see verses that I would like, I'd write them in my phone. And I remember going to, there was a book signing in Waxahachie and this little girl came up to me and she said, what is your favorite Bible verse? What is the one you live by? And I went, oh my gosh, I don't have one, right? And this is Texas, like most of the time people are into that, you know what I mean? They, they get that, 
thing dialed in and I, I went, hang on just a second. And I, I went to my phone and I got it and I looked up in my notes, all the Bible verses that I had looked at. And so, you know, there's a line waiting and I was like, nope, this is important. And so I came back to her and I said, this is it. This is the one. And it was Micah 6, 8, the one you just read. And ever since then, from that moment, I have signed every single email book, everything with everything, but like the checks I write, you know what I mean? With Micah 6, 8, it, it represents everything that I want to be. And I feel like that mercy is one thing, just justice is another there's a you know it allows you to be strong and kind and humble and so it, it encompasses everything for me so i want to continue that just one step further because the miracle of this is years went by and i thought about this little girl so often and thought what a gift it was that she asked me in that moment and it was i felt like the holy spirit to kind of work through her too like you know would you get Taya to please put something out there, you know, so whatever, right? Or maybe it's just her. I don't care. Either way, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And so on my last book tour with American Spirit, which by the way, I think is super encouraging to people, especially right now. It's full of stories of how you think it all is lost and something good, a twist happens. So I was praying about it. I, it never occurred to me to pray. Like I said, I talk about praying, but I, I can consistently amazed at the areas that God will work in because I, you know, it's one of those things like, do you pray about the little things or, you know, and I just said, God, I wish I would meet that girl again. I want to thank her. I wish I knew where she was. So I could just thank her for asking that one question, that small thing that started this ripple effect. It was like, I think it was two days later. I'm at a book signing on the other side of town from Texas, you know, 45 minutes an hour from the other one. And this girl walks up to me and she says, do you remember me? And I, I kind of looked at her, I was like, I feel like, and she said, I'm the one who asked you about your Bible verse. I mean, I busted out in tears, like full on crying. Cause I was like overwhelmed. Like I just prayed about this. What are the chances? How in the world do you ask to meet this girl? And then God delivers it like two days later. And for years, I had been wanting to thank her for years. I thought about her. And then I finally asked and it was like, Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Here you go. Uh, you know, I just, I find those things miraculous and I'm not, you know, it's not like, you know, there, it's God's not a robot, right? We don't just get to say, Hey, can I have this? Can I have that? And you get it. But I think he knows the depth of certain things and he knows the power in certain situations. And for me, that was one of those just, it was a deep soulful wish. And I think he knew I had it all along. And, and when I asked for it, there it was. So yeah, that's a long-winded answer, man, to what you, what you just, you read me a Bible verse and she talks for 15 minutes, but yeah, <laughs> it's a big deal. It's, it's all, it's all good. It's all good. Um, but also, right, you've gone through some unimaginable grief as well. And how has your faith seen you through that? You know, that, so I, I describe it this way where if you, you know, your child, let's say, let's say the doctors tell you your child has to have an amputation and you know that they have to have it. There's no getting around it. What do you do, right? You're not gonna sit your, your baby down and say, listen, your life is gonna be this, 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 and this. This is what you're gonna experience. It's gonna be awful. Like you don't tell them all the details, right? You start to prepare them lovingly. You maybe give them a little bit of digestible information here. You tell them, I'm with you, baby. I'm with you now. I'm gonna be with you during and I'll be with you after. I'm never leaving you. You comfort them, you teach them, you prepare them the best you can. You, you go with them to the surgery and then afterward you say, okay, we're prepared for this. I'm still here. And guess what? This is what I do. And I think y'all would do this too. Nothing's going to stop you. We got this. You know what you're going to do? You're going to take your body out there with one less limb and you're going to show the world what you can do because you're strong enough. You're good enough, right? You have joy and you're not going to lose it. This amputation isn't the end. And so I look at the loss of Chris's life for me that way. I could not have loved him more. And I, I believe that God also, if he's a God that keeps his promises, could not have stopped it because it was free will of man, you know, and this guy, according to psychiatrists on his side and prosecution and defense said he did not have PTSD. He never had trauma in his life in or out of the military, according to them. So it was a choice. And it, it, you know, in my opinion, it was a choice. I, I can't see it any other way. You know, there was no proof um, in the case of mental illness or anything else. So, so free will, 
And that was the amputation. And I watched God in retrospect. I said, wow, he prepared me in small ways all along. He taught me when I went through funerals with my, you know, our friends and I saw my friends who were widows and I had time to contemplate and I saw them survive it, even though they didn't know how. And I, I had the time to talk with Chris about death and what our wishes are. And, you know, I had the time to think, God forbid, if it ever happened, you know, and nothing ever fully pre prepares you for the amputation itself. But those little bits of digestible information along the way allowed me to stand, you know, sometimes crawl, sometimes roll up in the fetal position, but always get back up to standing again. And so my faith just grew. I, I really never saw it as God doing this. I, I don't, I mean, at one point I thought maybe, right? Maybe he just had to because it would benefit a lot of other people. And maybe we were sort of the sacrificial lamb in a way. And, and one of my other friends who's a widow said, Taya, I don't believe that. She's like, I think God is crying with us. And I really thought about it. And then I talked to a lot of people after that about good and evil. And really, was it God? Was it Satan? Is Satan real? You know, wh what is this whole thing? And and I, I really figured out in the end, I think, and this epiphany one day that in my mind, it really is this. It's that Satan was a fallen angel. He challenged God. He told God, God's not all that. And God said, okay, what, do you, you know, what are you prepared to do about this? What do, it's your choice, right? And he said, I choose to fight. I'm going to fight you and I'm going to win. And so God said, okay. And I believe that he created earth and he put his beloved souls here knowing it would only be a vapor, right? A blink of an eye in eternity. And, you know, in Genesis, it says he regretted it the moment he did it, but I think he only regretted it because he didn't want his children to feel pain. He also knew they'd be okay because he still had their back and he was still going to be with them. So I think this life is just a chess game. And I think that every time Satan makes a move on the chessboard, we get a little nervous, right? And we wonder if it's the end of the game. And I see it as you know, especially with fear. Fear is one of those things where I think when we're in fear, that's Satan going, check, right? And God's the master chess player. So he's moved so many steps ahead. And I think he comes in and he goes, check, no, check mate, mother, <laughs> right? Like, you know, that, that's what I've been saying as a parent. Somebody messes with my kid, I'd be like, oh, you can put my kid in check? Fine, you know what, check mate, mother. So, but, you know, that's just, I think, I think it's a chess game. And I think that's why I now see it as, I'm not, you're not going to put me in check. You're not going to put me in fear. It's not, not to say I don't feel it. And there's a difference between a gut feeling, by the way. There's a difference between a Holy Spirit nudging where the, where the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you're like, get out of there. That's different. I'm talking about the fear of things that aren't that, right? So yeah, I think the, I just continue to see God in different ways. And the more I see him, the more I want everybody else to have it. I want people to be happy. I want them to know that they're okay. And that, yeah, bad things happen. They're going to, it's unavoidable. So you can worry about them or you can just enjoy what's in front of you and know you're gonna be okay when it happens. Hey, before Julie gets to the question, I wanna read a comment here from uh, Ohets Revilo. He says, Taya, thank you for your strength that you have shown throughout all the hardships that you have gone through. Chris was somebody that I had just learned about when I had started my military career. I was at Cowboy Stadium for his funeral. Your tact, even there, has shown me how to shine through every hard thing I go through. Wow, that is, thank you for that. I'm, I'm so glad I, I feel like that's such a blessing because anytime we can help each other out, I feel like that, that's a purposeful existence in a life. And I, I love that, I love that it was helpful and that people can draw from parts of my life because I wouldn't be this strong if I didn't draw from other people's lives too. It's just this big ripple effect of they strengthen me and I can help, help pay it forward. That's a huge blessing, so thank you. And I appreciate y'all's service too. I mean, it's the hard stuff. Yeah, Lynch, Lynch, uh, Lynch Schenk says, Taya, what an inspiration you have been and continue to be. Just listening to you right now is increasing my faith and encouraging to me and so many. God bless. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. 
Amen. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Also, Taya, um, Marie Parker says, hi from Fort Hood. I got to see you a few years ago here at Fort Hood for your book signing. You look great. And thanks for all you continue to do for everyone. Oh, thank you. You guys are so good to me. I feel healthier. Let me tell you, we look back sometimes the kids and I look back and we go, there was this, there was this period of time where, you know, I was really into organic food and healthy and I didn't want to see fast food before Chris died, you know, and then he died. And I thought, man, I'm glad he had Whataburger this week. Right. I'm glad he ate the tar out of some bacon. You know, I'm glad he ate the plate of bacon fat. Um, you know, and so I, I got to this point where I was like, you know what, kids? I mean, first of all, who, who's going to do all that work when you're in the middle of grief and devastating loss and there's a mountain of stuff? So on the one hand, there was convenience. On the other hand, I was like, who cares? And we look back at pictures now and we go, oh, okay, those were the tubby years. We call them the tubby years. <laughs> so hopefully I'm getting back more and more fit all the time as I get healthier and healthier, but it's hilarious, man. No you touched... Yeah. <laughs> you touched on this a little bit, but can you talk to us about the Chris Kyle Frog Foundation, um, about its mission, and then how people who are watching with us can get involved? Yes, I appreciate you asking. You know, I we're working on potentially changing the name a little bit because I know it doesn't. Our name doesn't say what our mission is, but our mission, and I think that would be helpful. So, so look for a change there. But it's um, it's always going to be an honor of Chris too, and. The frog is, you know, Navy SEAL frogman. So um, I knew from a business standpoint that wasn't the best strategy, but it was a very emotional time, and I wanted to represent the frog skeleton, you know, uh, which represents the seals watching over their brothers. And Chris loved all military first responders. So after he died, you know, it was 2013, and I didn't have this need to continue his name for any uh, any reason, right? He had, he did that enough for himself, and I was comfortable with that. But I had this, we, we decided that we wanted to do something. Originally, we wanted to give the proceeds from American Sniper away. We thought of two families and um, in the end, one didn't, didn't want it. And um, the other one was a different situation. And, and Chris was like, you know, we're not doing this. We got to spread it out. And so I, I thought, you know, if I could do something, it has to be something that's not already being done. And I noticed that there was not, uh, um, anybody helping marriage and, and it came to me in this moment where I was like I'm so glad that our marriage was good that we ended on a high note because how painful would it have been to lose him in one of those moments that we were not as good and then it got me to thinking how did we get there how did we get so strong because at the time that he was in there was only it was 97 percent divorce rate for enlisted guys in the SEAL teams you know I think they've improved that substantially now but I, I thought how do we get there and how can I give that gift to other people? I was thinking maybe in a few years I would get to that. God was like, oh, I'm so glad that you heard what I was saying. So here you go, baby girl. These three reasons that you think you can't do it, dropped one in my lap. The next month, dropped the next one. I'm like, oh, no, no. Seriously, now? Not right, like right now? And then the third one dropped and I was like, oh, gosh, okay. So I started it in 2013 and um, and God's taken care of the details since then and um. I, I've always said it's his mission. I just don't want to screw it up. And I feel like, you know, the mission is to strengthen those families and, and make marriage a place that people run to and not from. And I think our war fighters and everybody involved in that effort, there are so many attacks coming against your marriage, but you need a safe place at home too. We all do. And, and yet the attacks against you, like that chess game, I think Satan's putting our service people in check all the time because he knows how powerful they are. And he knows those military families when they're strong are unstoppable. And so I think the attacks are coming and I want to be part of checkmate. I want to do my part to say, mm -mm, not today, right? So in order to do that, we have to give tools to our military and first responders because they're not out there right now. They just aren't. And they're not that simple. So, I mean, they're not that difficult. They're more simple than we think. So what we do is we bring people into the family. They're with us for two years. They go through four programs and it's not all at once. It's that same methodology of digestible chunks, right? We do a little bit, wait, because marriage is not an overnight fix. You're not going to go to one seminar and, you know, yay. You might go to one seminar and be like, okay, we're on a different, you know, we're on a different path. So we, we do repeated things and it's been 
one of the biggest blessings in my life is to know these couples and to be able to witness their transformation. They're doing it for themselves. We're getting the tools and we're giving them the information and the brotherhood. We're giving them a sisterhood, a network of people who are not in their job, right? Like Julie and Leah and she, you know, you don't want to necessarily have everybody you work with know all your business and all your struggles and all that, right? Sometimes it's nice to have somebody outside of it, but also somebody who understands. And that's what we do is we provide that network of um, opportunity to be totally vulnerable and not risk your career and not miss out on a promotion because somebody at your work knows that things are bad, which is insane, but it does happen, right? So it's, it's been an incredible blessing to work with these marriages. I'm super excited. In the next couple of weeks, I'm announcing our new board, and it's ridiculous. It's so good. Um, the first lady of Texas, Cecilia Abbott, is going to be the vice president of the board, and I've got these power players. Uh, Sheriff Wayburn, he was Air Force and then <clears throat> chief of police for 31 years. Yes, and then he's, um, he's like, police is like, he's got my vote. Um, Air Force, got my vote. You got it. Yeah, Tarrant County, baby. So he's sheriff out there now and one of the top uh, 10 biggest counties, I think, in the country. And so uh, one of Chris's teammates from the SEAL teams uh, is going to be on there representing him. And then we've got just some other incredible professionals who are going to contribute. So I think we're taking it to new heights. We, we had some rough uh, experiences that I did not expect and that I would say were definitely Satan's moves on the check, you know, chessboard. But um, over the last six months, we've been through a lot and it's been hard and it's been a slog, but I feel like we're on this, um, this awesome trajectory where we can help the people that are waiting for help. So I'm excited. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, sounds great. Uh, can you tell us, Taya, a little bit more? So you talked earlier about the Warrior Collection jewelry. Um, how talking about faith again, how can that line help strengthen faith? You know, it's so oh, thank you for asking that. It's, it's the logo is a, a B and an E. So it's a, a backwards B that butts up to the frontwards E and the middle forms a cross and a sword warrior collections. And we're off and running typical of me off and running without like everything dialed in, but we've got the, the, the pieces are dialed in. We've got the boxes, the cards, it's accessing your warrior within. I'm working with Angela Zadapek, who has Elevari jewelry, also a very good Mother's Day gift, by the way, that's her baby. And um, they're very affordable, cool pieces of faith. You can get them online, Elevari, E-L-E-V-A-R-E -E -E, jewelry. And her whole goal was to have conversation starters. Maybe not the obvious cross because we, we gave a sample to one of my friends. She works at a bank. And she said, I've not taken off my cross necklace for the last 25 years. And she said, what was interesting is she put on one of these pieces and hers was the Elevari piece. And people asked her, asked her about it all day long. Because if you see a cross, you know what they're saying. You don't have to ask them, right? But you see something different and you ask them and it opens up a conversation. So it did exactly what Angela wanted to do, which was make something a conversation starter. And I find that fascinating because I think that's where the real learning happens. And also we're a free society. How cool is that? We can talk about whatever we want. There are a lot of people in a lot of countries who are not allowed to do that. And so our first piece is um, a B and E beginning and end. I don't think I described that. It probably would have been helpful. I am the alpha the, and the omega, the beginning and the end. And we put the cross and the sword in the middle because it's just life. This part in the middle, it's just a life and it's a mission. And Bill Wayburn said this so beautifully you know, he said, if you're looking to this life to be your comfort, you're missing so much. If you see this life as your mission and you're God's warrior, you're on, man, right? You look at life differently. You look at life like, I'm here to do something. I'm here to do something big and, and you're in the fight. And I just think that's, that's the coolest thing because there are kids who are warriors. My kids are, are freaking warriors, man. They're bad asses. And they're the kindest, gentlest, funniest, most loving people, right? And they're badass warriors within. They don't have to, they don't have to demonstrate it. They don't, nobody else has to know that. They know it. And so our collection is really for people to wear something that reminds them that A, they wear the armor of God, that B, they are a warrior, regardless of the outside and whatever else, they are a warrior. 
right? And C, it's a conversation starter. So we've worked pretty hard to get that badass feel. And, and the first line for Memorial Day is it's unisex. I mean, our, our guys are freaking loving it, which I'm super excited about. And uh, I, I mean, I'll be wearing one. I don't know, but I wear a baseball hat too. So I think we'll have it. <laughs> You're rocking that baseball cap. Love it. Yeah, it had some gray, which is also pretty cool. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> you don't look like you need it. You look like you're doing just fine. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, say a quick question from uh, Brenda Simcoe. She asked, how old are your kids now? And do they know how much of a hero their father was and how many people have been touched by his life? That's so cool. Yeah, they're teenagers. And I often tell people and it's the truth. If, if God's handing out the kids that you deserve, right on the other side if he's like yay you know gabriel or whatever you know give them what they deserve and gabriel's just about to give me the kids i deserve and god was like no 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 no, no. hold on we're gonna we're gonna do her solid i know those are the ones she deserves but let's give her the good ones they're so cool and they're strong you know we purposefully raised them when they were little to not really care about what chris is doing with american sniper i mean they knew we were going to do some things but he was dad that's what he was to them, you know, and I'm, I never forget one of the interviews that he did where he said I was a much better, she said, you know, the interview, he was like, what are you going to do if you can't, you know, kill people anymore, which is a stupid question, um, because he always saw it as saving people, right, but if, and he said, well, I've, I'm a much better husband and a father than I ever was a sniper, and, you know, it, it doesn't start, I think he always, I think he was made that way, and I think that, military life challenges that but certainly when he was around and when we learned the tools that we needed he's absolutely that right and he's just a heck of a guy so they got to enjoy him as dad and that's what we wanted and they still haven't seen the movie and they will but i felt like it was important for them to have their own memories solidified and for them to never look back and wonder did they merge the memory of their dad with the movie uh or or not and i i um you know, just a point on Bradley is he, he also said he'd love to be there for the first time that they see it. And I think that speaks to his character too, just that he really did care and he really did do it for Chris's kids as much as anything else so that they would have um, that ability to, to cherish that movie as a part of their dad, not just somebody else playing a role. So I think the connection will be super cool, but, uh, we talked about it recently, but we, it's coming. It's just not that important. Um, they do, to get back to the question too, they do realize that their dad is loved. I think the other part of this though, and, and I remember there was a time when my son was very young, Chris was alive. He might've been six or seven and somebody at school was making fun of him for the socks he was wearing. Like they weren't the right brand or whatever. And he was discouraged because he doesn't do that to other people. Why would they do that to him, right? So we had this talk and I said, babe, you know that there are a lot of people who love daddy. And he said, yes. I said, do you think there are any people who hate dad? And he said, no, right? why would they do that? He's such a good, and I said, they do. There are people out there who really hate him and say really mean things about him, but that's them. They have a problem, right? It's not dad. It doesn't change who he is. That says something about them. And he was like, oh, Right, and I said, so this this other guy, and I explained to, to my son some of the things that I knew were the background of this kid's life, and he did have a hard time, and he did have some things that other kids might not have known about, and, and I didn't betray any confidences in telling my son, but I, I told him so you'd have compassion and learn to love the person who is being mean to him for what he is, right? A human being who's also suffering, and so, Interestingly enough, I didn't even put this together, but a few years later, he wore crazy socks to school, like funny, you know, like like um, sharks holding cues, uh, pool cues, you know, like pool shark, or, you know, just just fun stuff. Just like I'm kind of a big deal with big old. I mean, you know, just goofy stuff, and he had a lot of fun with it. And I just think, okay, I wonder if those two were connected in any way. Where he was like, you know what, you say whatever you want, it doesn't affect who I am, it doesn't change who I am. So. I think we've been able to use Chris's life as an example for good, for the reality of human nature that there are good people and, and people who want to hate just for the sake of hating. 
in his death, we've had an aftermath where we could not have predicted the loss of different friends and family members that has been also painful. And it, and it, it also, you know, it allowed us this opportunity to say, okay, well, who are we, right? Who are we as people and what do we stand for? And, and are we allowed to set boundaries? And we are, and we're good people setting boundaries. You know, how do you forgive somebody who murdered your dad or your husband? What does forgiveness look like? Do you forgive people and let the abuser back in? You know, all of those questions that I feel like that's part of the reason I'm writing the Prayers for Bears series, because I see my kids as so blessed and mature because they've learned these lessons sooner. And, um, and some people go a lifetime without learning them. And hopefully they went a lifetime without the pain that came with it, but you can't ignore that they're, they're better people. And as my son once said to me when I was trying to protect him from telling him all these things, he said, mom, and, and mind you, the kid's like nine at the time. And I said, baby, I just don't think you need to know all these things. Cause he knew there was a lot of things going on and court cases and all that stuff. I said, I just don't want you to worry about it. And he said, mom, don't you think if you tell me now, I'll be more prepared when I go in the real world later. I was like, dude, you're nine. How do you come up with this stuff? <laughs> um, yeah, okay, we can do that. So, you know, the kids are great and they, um, they have learned a lot from both Chris's life and his death. And fortunately they were at an age where they remember how he loved them, right? They weren't in this awful teenage time when the rug was taken out from under them and they weren't so little that they don't remember him. They've had time to heal before they got into the, the teens. And so, you know, there's never a good time to lose somebody you love. And yet I can see that, um, you know, with all the challenges that we had coming at us, you know, maybe there was something to that, that timing. I, mean, I can't even finish the sentence. Like it's not, it's never good, right? I just, I just think they're okay. And maybe the, maybe that time for us allowed us the opportunity to learn some things at a tender age that prepared us for the, the onslaught of things that would come next. So yeah, Chris has been, um, he's continued to teach and love us and I know we feel him and, and we don't, you know, we don't let ourselves be sad just for the sake of being sad either. So, you know, we acknowledge the days like the anniversary of his death and stuff, but we don't, we've learned not to expect a certain feeling and then make it happen. We're, we've learned how to submit to whatever life brings that day. If we feel good, we feel good. If we feel bad, we feel bad. But for me, that's a big deal because, you know, I, um, to really just totally submit to life and, and admit that I really don't have that big of an impact on what comes next is, um, it's probably the best thing I've learned and it was probably one of the hardest. Wow. Hey, Taya, are we, are we good on time for a couple more questions? I, I know you had okay. another engagement. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. All right, just wanted to make sure. I didn't know, I, I don't want you running off. Like, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> So here we go. We just got a few more questions. Uh, um, what words of inspiration do you have for all the? Oh, sorry. Uh, what words of inspiration do you have for our war fighters on the front line? I just want you to know that you're strong and you're cherished, and you are thought about by more people than you realize. And you know, no matter what you see in the media, I remember Chris being overseas and they had on, it was CNN at the time, and I have friends who work for CNN, I'm not trying to slam them at all, but at the time, the newscasters were really harsh about being in Iraq, and he was feeling so discouraged. It's like, I'm out here fighting for all of you, and you're going to say whatever you say, and I would encourage you not to listen to that, because the truth is that so many people in this country love our military, man. They care, and they love you, and they got your back, and they might be quieter, but they're looking for ways to thank you. I talk to people all the time for our foundation and they want to thank you and support you and support your family. And I would say if I had one little tidbit for our warfighters, if you think you're doing your family a service by keeping your hardships to yourself with all love and respect, you're wrong. They want to be a part of your life. They want to know you're suffering. They're stronger than you think. They're capable. And you as a warfighter, need a hero too, right? As Corey Weathers, who works for our foundation, she's brilliant, by the way, Corey Weathers. 
find her online. She's amazing. She's like, you're a sheepdog. Like, who's feeding the sheepdog? Right? We're here to feed you. And you're allowed to be fed. It's, it's, you have your place to do your, your battle. And we have our place to prepare you and love you and, and care for you so that you're a stronger warfighter when you're out there. Give us a chance. Uh, Taya, we um, thank you for, for those words. I, I'm, those were, were powerful and meant a lot to the, the military community that's watching with us. We also know that you understand the exchanges mission. You've spoken to our, our, our managers before um, at our conference here in Dallas-Fort Worth a few years ago. Um, we have about 33,000 associates all over the world. Right now, we're mission essential. Most of our locations are still open, serving warfighters and their families. 85% of our workforce is connected to the military. What words of encouragement do you have for exchange associates during COVID-19 pandemic? Um, anything you wanna maybe give to, to tell them to keep going? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things as I've looked at life and I've really tried to be analytical about it and fair about it, I've noticed that we think we can avoid certain things, right? And I remember vividly getting an alarm system for our house after American Sniper, the book came out and telling, asking Chris and saying, babe, have we done enough to protect you? Have we covered all our bases? And he said, we have. He said, but I'll tell you something, if somebody wants to kill me, they will, right? So when I looked at that and I looked at our other friends who Chris would be running down an alleyway with bullets flying by his head not get shot, not get killed. We'd have other friends, they step off in, you know, at the wrong time or at, at a first deployment and they die, right? It, there was no sense to these things. There was no avoiding these things. And so you're out there in the middle of this pandemic and you're brave enough to serve others and your mission essential, you have your job, which is a blessing, but there's also probably your family feels fearful sometimes, remember? Fear is Satan putting you in check, right? If you're not supposed to be there, you won't be. God was able to put in a lot of things for the Twin Tower people that, that stopped a bunch of people from being there. I don't think he wanted those who died to die. I do think he did good with it if they let him you know, in. But my point is you could not go to work. And if you were going to get COVID, you were going to get it. You would have gotten it at the gas station. You would have gotten it at the grocery store, right? Like your plan is, your path is already kind of mapped out. This time here is linear and we think that we have some control, but it's like, it's already a path that exists on this realm that we don't know, we're not aware of. So I would say if, if I could give any advice, I would say look in the mirror and, and see that badass who's out there doing the work. You're the one on the front line. You're showing up for other people. That's badass. You know, be smart wear the gloves, you know, wear the mask. Don't, you know, don't play with fire and don't be afraid. If you're not supposed to be there, you won't. And I don't think you're going to get it. And if you do, right, uh, chances are you can't pinpoint that it was because you were at work that day or it's because you filled up your tank with gas or, you know, we can't, we tr even, even the common cold as parents, we always try to figure out how did my kid get sick? I bet it was this, I bet we'll never figure it out. The way of germs is not that clear. We just can't figure it out. So I hope that helps. And more than anything, I hope you know that um, there are a lot of people praying for you while you're out there doing the work. I know I pray for people who are doing the essential work. There are a lot of other people praying for you. And um, yeah, I think chances are greater that you won't get it than that you will. Awesome. Thank you, Taya. Thank you for those words of encouragement for our associates, um, you know, who are out there facing it every, every day. Um, and who keep the mission of serving war fighters, um, you know, at, at heart. Um, we, we greatly appreciate what they're doing as well. Definitely. Want to share some comments with you. Linda says, thank you for sharing your strength and faith. Um, and Marcy says, you are a true inspiration. Just finished American Wife and American Sniper. And then um, Taya, one more, just before you go, um, remind us and remind the people who are watching where they can find um, more information about you and the Chris Kyle Frog Foundation um, online. Let us know where, where they can go to get okay. info. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Chris Kyle, frogfoundation.org. We have our social media, so Instagram and Facebook, it's C-K-F-F-D-N. So um, FDN is foundation. And then I'm at Taya Kyle, American Wife, and that's on Facebook and Instagram. I'm not so good at Twitter. I probably need to pick up my Twitter game a little bit. But um, yeah, that's where you can find it. I have a website too, and I'm working on amping that up a little bit more, but it is tayakyle.com. And I, I do most of the updates though and my communication on social media for sure. Yeah. Hey, Taya, what's on a uh, quick question? I'm just asking random, random yeah. question now. <laughs> what does Taya Kyle, what kind of music does she listen to? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Nobody has asked me that in all the interviews and all the years. Uh, I used to listen to Country with Chris, and then it made me cry a lot after he died, right? And you remember that song, Hey Pretty Girl? Um, last name is Moore, Kit, Kit Moore. Oh my gosh, I remember driving and Hey Pretty Girl came on and I felt like it was the story of our life and it crushed me. And I was like, you know what? I'm out, no more country. So I, uh, so I, I, I stopped that and I, I used to not like Christian music because what I heard of it was, this is awful to say, I'm just gonna say it okay. And I have friends who are, who are Christian vocalists and musicians now, so please just, Take this with a grain of salt as my ignorance. But what I had heard, I thought maybe these people just aren't that good. And so like Christian music is the only place they can get played. That's awful. It's not true. But it was what I experienced with the songs that I had heard, right? And so in another divinely orchestrated thing, I had some friends come to my house and I said, listen, if I didn't know better, I would think this house itself is under attack. Like the weirdest things are happening that are so costly, so crazy, it's freaking me out, right? And he told me of this one experience that he and his wife had with their little girl. They were building a, a home in Temecula, California, and the dog would have like the hairs on the back of its neck stand up. And the, the daughter was little and she was like, daddy, who's that? Like behind him, I mean, creepy, right? And he was like, oh, hell no, this guy doesn't, he's does not mess around, right? He was like, I'm out. And so he, um, he said, we left our house and we put on Christian music 24 seven and we left for a week, just let that radio play. He said, we came back never had another bad experience and everybody that came to their house said it was the most peaceful place ever right so i'm like well whether this is true or not i'm at that point i'm desperate so if i'm gonna play christian music in my house i'm gonna have to work and i'm gonna have to find stuff right oh my gosh so then i, I find matt powell need to breathe zach williams big daddy weave like all these guys who are just cool they have great voices lauren daigle i mean they're like they're ridiculous right so i have my playlist and I, I, I seek out the Christian music that I like because I don't like all of it, but uh, I, I usually put that on. And it, I mean, my kids have, you know, we'll listen to some of the more popular stuff. And I hate to say it because it makes me feel old, but those lyrics suck, dude. They're so bad. And I'm like, I, just, I don't know. I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, it is what it is. Like, it's got a good beat if I could tune out the lyrics, but of course I can't because I'm a deep thinker and analytical and I'm like, so yeah, so that's it. I, I Christian, and I do listen to some country now. And my son, uh, this generation now, this, the teenagers, they're going back and drawing from, at least in our area, my son and some of his friends, they're growing back and finding like 80s and 90s and 70s. And they're finding the songs they like and they're doing these playlists that are like all the decades together. They're just so cool. I mean, my son was in there cooking dinner the other night and playing this playlist that I was like, oh my God, I'm singing along. I know these songs, so. That's, that's a, again, a long-winded answer. What kind of music do y'all listen to? Oh. Chief? You oh. asked the question. Oh, man. I, I, asked the, I listen a little bit of everything because I have to. So I, I listen to hip-hop, you know, R&B. I'll listen to, to, to rock. And then I, I've recently, since we've been interviewing so many country singers, I've been listening to country music. <laughs> you know, I understand it. So I'm really, you know, trying to get into it, listening to it. So it's it's just a little bit of everything right now. Okay, so my friend Scott Brown, he's Scooter Brown band. Check him out. He's dropping a new song. We interviewed him. Oh, we talked to him. Okay. He's awesome. <laughs> yes. Okay. He's amazing. Um, yeah, he's one of my favorite. Of course, Craig Morgan's still doing stuff, and he's got his show. And um, there we're, gonna Craig, we're gonna have Craig on on the 26th. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're working with Craig. Who? 
Cafe Anderson. C O F F E Y Anderson. Yeah. I'm yes. In touch with him. He's, he's good and he's cute too. <laughs> he's cute. He's cute. His, wife, his wife does uh, hip hop dance and stuff. She, the beast. I mean, wow. she's just fighting cancer and she's so freaking cute. I mean, there's, we got lots of people for you guys to interview. It'll be fun. Yay! Yeah. So, so tell you one other question. Do you watch Netflix? I do sometimes. I mean, I don't really watch. That's the other thing that changed after Chris died. I don't watch a lot of heavy stuff, but yeah. Nothing on TV, no movies? Oh, no, I mean, I do. You're going to laugh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I watch French films with subtitles. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I do. Um, there are these Taiwanese, <laughs> like, I don't know. I love seeing different cultures and stuff. So I end up finding like these international ones because a lot of the stuff that I feel like we're putting out is, dude, it's crap, right? It just makes me think of like the worst parts of society and life. And so I just try to, I want to escape. If I want to watch TV, I just want to escape. Um, but I do watch some of the, I'm trying to think of some of the sitcoms that I watched with my kids that were pretty funny. I mean, Borderline was pretty funny. I don't know if you've seen I've that. I've seen that. <laughs> what are you, what are you watching on Netflix? Go ahead, Chief. We just finished Tiger King, and that's, I don't even know what to say about Tiger King. <laughs> my friends grew up with him in the area. For real? Yeah, for real. Yeah, wild. Wow. Did I watched that show. I can't stand reality TV for the most part. Cannot stomach it. it it's, I wouldn't call it, re it's reality, but it's more like a documentary. Right. It's, which spans like years, but it's, I don't know, it's all over the place. It's crazy. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I like, I know crazies out there. I don't need to like, you know, pull more of it in. Cause I'm like, why you gotta be so crazy? I don't know. I can't, I can't. Mm -mm. You might lose a few brain cells watching it. <laughs> yeah. yeah but at least you're like involved in what's happening in the world. Cause everybody knows it. I don't know it, but everybody seems to know it. I don't know. <laughs> what else would you recommend besides Tiger King? What else should I watch? Well, I like Ozark. Ozark. That's good. Okay, watch that. Uh, it's, about, it's, about like, it's about money laundering. So it's an interesting show. Kevin Bateman's in it. Uh, uh, very interesting show. I like that. I've also been watching. Chief, I, this, is why, this is why I have a hard time. I've lived through murder. I've lived through some MFers who did the money laundering and embezzling in my world. Like, see, I don't want to watch. I've had too many. So maybe, maybe Netflix needs to reach out to you and we got to do a special on you. We got it. I mean, American Wife. Call Netflix, yeah. dude. Please. American, yes. American wife. Yes, it's so, it's so, I mean, I don't care if it's about me. I want more series that um, go beyond this to show other wives that people would be interested in their stories. You know, they're, um, but yeah, dude, please go to Netflix because I, MGM, that's one of our places that we're going is Netflix. And I feel like it would be a good fit because we have a lot of us out there who are like, yes, tell my story. There's a universal theme that happens in, these military marriages and there's a crossover with military and civilian marriages too there's a lot that's different but there's a crossover and i constantly talk to civilians who are like i want to know more about that life i don't right and i talk to military people who say their friends and neighbors who they've lived near near these guys for like 10 years let's say right and this is not uncommon 10 years they were stationed in one place at least in the seal teams right sometimes they're they're stationed there that long and they don't live on base and their neighbors watch American Sniper and they come over and they go, dude, is that what you went through? And they're looking at them like, yeah, that's what I went. What do you mean? That's what I, you didn't know? Like you didn't pick up on that? No, they don't. Cause it's not their world. They don't know. So I want that show to be a gift to people who A, want to be understood and B, for people who want to understand. I see it as a total bridge, you know, that we can, we can build. So yes. Chief, go to Netflix. Get everybody to like call in and be like, "American Wife, American Wife." We interviewed Mark Wahlberg uh, last week, I believe, and so we all watched Spencer Confidential um, to prepare for that. So, if you want to check that one out, take that for sure. Yeah. He did, he did. What? Oh, Mark did give a shout out to a buddy of yours, Marcus Luttrell. I think you know Marcus Luttrell, right? Yes, love he did a Shout out to him. He should. Yeah, they're good friends, which is awesome, and. The, um, there was another movie that Mark Wahlberg did about, uh, is it called All in the Family or something with uh, foster kids and something like Instant that? Instant Family. Instant Family. family. Okay, yeah. thank you. All in the Family is different. Okay, Instant Family. I still have that on my watch list because uh, I have a lot of my friends have adopted 
a number of kids and, and foster to adoption and they're getting them out of the foster care system. And they watched it with their kids who were adopted from all different places. And they all said, that is the real, deal. like that literally is like somebody had a camera in there and it's funny and it's you, know, you have good. to have humor if you're going to do that. So you watched it. it I did. Yeah. It's really good. And he told us that it was based on a true story, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's probably why it's so authentic then. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to bump that and Spencer Confidential up on my list for sure. The French awesome. <laughs> you watch Instant Family. I think at the end of the, at the credits, they actually have pictures of the real family. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Okay. Yeah, so you get to see the pictures of the real family and you know going to court and adoption all that stuff so it's it's a i thought it was a it was a different definitely a different movie enjoyable i thought it was a great film you know and it brought yeah. awareness to something that people don't probably aren't familiar with something people aren't familiar with right and and biblically father the fatherless right that's a big deal that we need to step that up bill wayburn's a big proponent of that too but i stayed up till uh like 2 30 in the morning it was 1 30 when i was finishing this chapter that i owed my editor um, I would on May 1st, but I had to get it to my co-author. <laughs> so she'd have one day to turn it around. Thanks, Taya. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so I stayed up late doing that. And today I've got more that I got more deadlines coming up, but tonight, I think I owe myself a celebration of getting that done. So tonight, Mark Wahlberg and my family are going to spend some time together on the big screen. And so thank you for that. Just decided. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That is awesome. So Taya, before we go, any last words, anything, anything you want to say? We, you know, I truly appreciate you taking time to give some, you know, you gave some motivational words to people. You, you instill some inspiration in the military community. I appreciate it. And on behalf of all of the service members watching, thank you so much for everything you've done. Like you said earlier, right? Turn fear into faith. So yes. Thank you. Yeah. You guys, thank you so much. I just love y'all. And I think it's so cool that you have this spirit of wanting to help your brothers in arms by doing these live interviews. And that just shows the creativity and the heart that during a pandemic, yeah, they're bad, but there's so much more good that we see that people are here for each other. And um, I love y'all. I love the people who serve and the families who support them. And I know that sometimes it feels like um, nobody gets you or nobody understands you or that it's just hard as hell. And it is hard, but you're strong enough and you're good enough, God loves you. And there are a lot of people like me who, who genuinely love you and appreciate your service too. And thank you guys for calling me and let me be a part of this, it's so cool. Thank you, it was so great to talk with you. You're awesome, so, so uplifting. Thank you so much. Absolutely, we'll stay in touch. You got it. I sent you, I owe you an email. I didn't forget, I owe you an email, I'm gonna send it to you. Yeah, dude, what's up? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got you, I owe you one. I was waiting for the day because I wanted to link this interview in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, do that. I'll put it on my social media, too. Okay. Yeah, right. I got you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good day. Thank bye. you, Bye, bye, Nugget. Oh, bye, Nugget. Bye, Nugget. Bye, Nugget. Bye, Nugget. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Bye.